Sure. Hello. Um, today is April 6th, and uh, my name is Colin Goldberg. I'm here with Michael Reese, um, and uh, I'm just going to um, pass the mic over to Michael to um, maybe introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background, like where you were born, uh, where you live and practice now, and any uh, cultural influences that you'd like to share. Sure. Um, well, my name is Michael Reese, and I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, I always like to mention that my father was an interior designer, which is a little bit odd, a little bit unusual. Um, but my mother was a uh, kind of a, um, definitely a housewife, but she also had moments where she wrote humor in, in newspaper columns, right? She did some newspaper columns, local newspaper columns and wrote humor. And she was always trying to write humor her whole life. And uh, so I love that about my mom. I love that she, she gave it the, the, that shot. So that's, and my brother's an architect and he lives in Kansas City, Missouri. So, uh, you know, we're, we kind of, um, you know, we kind of coalesced around expression, you know, art, artistic expression and uh, research and evolution from very early age, very important to us. I mean, the house was a, was like a brick allure, you know, full of objects and full of uh, collectibles. Now my mom and dad are past, but I have a lot of those objects. And so, you know, like, like even now, one of my favorite is this one. It's, you know, it's not even a very big one, or, but it's those Japanese lobsters, you know, that are made pounded tin and they're just beautifully made, extremely well done. They have fi fish and all kinds of different things. And they got this on one of their trips around the world. Uh, so I just keep this around. It kind of, I mean, it, it reminds me what objects are about and I'm sure we're gonna get into it a little bit, but you know, so much is stored in this object for me. It's not just about the object and, and it's sort of incredible craftsmanship and this sort of uh, almost like a precursor to robotics in a way, but it, it, you know, it's animate. It's, it's something to interact with, to play with, whatever. But it's also the store of memories. You know, I remember where it was in my house. I remember when my parents brought it home. I remember uh, things about it, things about the way my father presented it to people and showed it and, and you know, all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, that's what objects are amazing. Human beings are capable of storing all kinds of knowledge, information, et, et cetera, into uh, objects. So uh, cultural influences, you know, I, uh, I, went to, uh, I went to the Kansas City Art Institute, got my BA, BFA from there. And then I went to Germany and I studied in Dusseldorf and uh, I studied with Gunther Ucker, even though I was really, I wanted to study with Joseph Beuys, but Beuys was much too famous for doing that kind of nonsense at those times. And um, I was very interested in Joseph Beuys as an early artist, as a young artist. And, uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of controversy around boys and it just keeps coming. And, you know, I don't know how to parse all that stuff. It is an objective fact that I was interested in him. Objective fact that he was very influential in my early years. But it was also really important to meet him and to be able to reject him, you know, and to go to Europe and go to Germany and say, you know, that's not what I thought it was, and which was the case. That was the experience that I had when I, when I met boys. Um, and, um, you know, then I came back, I went to Yale and I was in, at, in graduate school at Yale and I had a lot of good people around me, notably Matthew Barney was a very uh, a great friend and, and we, we sort of came up together a little bit, good colleague, but also um, Michael Gray and Katie Shimmert and several other people that were at Yale that, uh, you know, maybe haven't gone on to have big art careers, but nonetheless. Were you there when Greg Little was there? Yeah, uh, actually, no, Greg? no, Greg, Greg was before me, but I know Greg from, uh, we were colleagues, well, his wife and I were colleagues at Oberlin, and he he teaches, of course, I, I thought it was at the Kent State, one of the Kent State Annex universities or something. But Well, he um, was the graduate advisor for both myself and Patrick. Yeah, and I knew I that. that you... No yeah, man, so that's, yeah that's I knew really that. We, we had met, yeah. So I knew Greg, uh, but not at Yale. He had already, he was prior to me at Yale. And, uh, you know, these kinds of things are really interesting because, you know, you've, you find yourself in a place like that, probably out of some sense of ambition. But then you, you luck out because what you do is you make lifelong friends and conversations. Really, lifelong—I mean, friends are very important. The people there and all that stuff. But sometimes, 
I have conversations going on in my head that aren't connected to anybody I know anymore, right? And so they, they start to see these rich things as well as what you define as art and what you define as your research, what you define as worthwhile and meaningful, these social experiences are extremely important. And so, you know, I, I think it's sad in a way that people have to go to grad school and why we can't sort of create this in the general, uh, in the general sort of milieu. But, you know, that's, I guess that's a little bit what the art world is. The art world is this laboratory of those kinds of ideas of those kinds of social interactions and how people are evolving, developing, pushing, et cetera. I love that kind of conversation. I love that. That's why I guess I live in the New York area still because, uh, you know, it's still here. It's, you know, despite all the problems and the coverings up and the comings and goings, you know, the economy is to hell and COVID has ruined New York and all that. It's still artists all over the place. And they're, still going to come to New York, they're still going to be, so I'm going on and on now. <laughs> Maybe. No, it's interesting, you know, and I feel like, the, um, you know, for me, I mean, my parents um, were both PhD chemists, and they, you know, urged me to go to graduate school, because they're always big believers in education, yeah. and, you know, getting a terminal degree was important to them, even though now you can apparently get a, a doctorate of fine arts. Um, and so, but I mean, and, and what I found really the most valuable um, uh, component was, you know, the, the discourse conversations and critiques, but also having a couple of years to just make work, you know, and not have to think about um, doing something else at the same time. Like that was the purpose of my existence for that short time period. And um, I have to say, I definitely, I miss it sometimes, you know, but I feel like what, what's been going on with tech expressionism and the conversations that go on sort of in the salons, but also in like the Discord server and other stuff, it reminds me of graduate school where people are talking about the ideas behind the work and, and, yeah. and also the, you know, the, the process and what software do you use and this and that, but, but primarily, you know, to, to hear about the ideas. And that's interesting. And it's hard to find, I think, outside of some sort of a structured, environment in a lot of ways you know because so well, much you know, the, is about just commerce you know i mean the the thing is is that universities give you uh you know because of the loans and all the, i mean you know because of all those things it gives you a kind of financial security where you really can take those two years or sometimes three years or if you're getting a phd different but take those time and really invest it you know really take yourself seriously and give yourself a chance at being serious about art, you know? And lots of people drop off. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? And lots of people keep going. And so, but I love the discourse. I couldn't agree with you more. And I love the sort of personalities. I'm always amazed, no matter where I go, what I do, there's a lot of similarities and commonalities to, to people's stories, but everybody has such a kind of fingerprint of a personality, of a life experience, you know? And that's that's always pretty fascinating to me. Totally. I, I mean, that, did you did point. you know that you wanted to be an artist like from a very early age, or like did you sort of make a decision when yeah. you were graduating high school? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, uh, the thing that happened was that I, um, my brother, I was the younger of two two boys, right? My brother was older than I was, and he was he had my father's name, and my father was the designer. And so my brother was actually quite good very early with drawing and sculpting. And, and I don't know, he was in a magazine. They had him with his sculptures and stuff. And, you know, and it was sort of to promote how talented my dad, you know, my dad's progeny were. <laughs> and so I was always kind of intimidated because, you know, developmentally, I'm a couple of years behind. I couldn't do anything like that, et cetera. And so in a way, he kind of occupied that spot in our family. And what I did instead was I thought I wanted to be a writer. And so I studied, you know, I wrote short stories and poems and God, they're awful. <laughs> they're so bad. And uh, maybe they still are bad. They didn't get any better. And, um, you know, that's what I thought I wanted to do. That's where I thought I wanted to go with it is uh, to be a, a writer. And then I went to college and uh, I, you know, met some people some wonderful people that were great artists and loved art and all that stuff. And they kind of just, it was like a whole renaissance for me. It really happened. And the other thing, it coincided with me learning about Egon Schiele, who I'd never known about. 
when I was a kid in the Midwest. I think there were a couple of shows uh, in galleries in New York. I think, I can't remember. I'm thinking it was Tibor Danaji, but maybe it wasn't. Um, and I saw these Egon, and it just like blew me away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, you know, you talk about expressionism. Um, you know, that stuff is so powerful and poignant. And I'll never forget. I mean, it was almost like receiving energy uh, through these works. I mean, they did something to me. They changed me. And uh, for a long time, I made a lot of drawings that look like Egon Schiele, which, which you know, it's funny about art. Uh, you know, originality is so important. And, all, and you know, we've kind of knocked that down pretty good. But the thing is, is when you're a young artist, you're trying to find a place. And that sense of copying, which is so much the way we learn language and so much the way we learn so many things is by mimicking, you know? And uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, mimicking other artists and try and, you know, what a great experience that was because as you are trying to construct, uh, doing a lot of drawing and painting, as you try to construct a drawing or you're trying to construct a painting, you're thinking through them and, you, and th you're thinking your own thoughts, but you're also thinking through them. And it's almost like you're on the inside of it. And I just think that's a, a really powerful, rich experience for young artists. It's almost impossible not to do. You know, remember that famous book by, um, uh, you know, um, Bloom, the, uh, the Anxiety of Influence, you know? It's such a good book, such an interesting book about how you know, poets would do the same thing. They would adopt the voice and the language of the earlier poet, the more famous poet. It does so many things for you. It shows you that you can do it. It shows you uh, that that you have to reject it at a certain point to find your own voice. And um, so, you know, that was part of my early experience as an artist was doing all these paintings. And then one day came and um, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I'd go to school. I didn't know, you know, what to do with myself. And I realized sort of, I became a carpenter, started making money, you know, just helping with carpentry and stuff. And at night, I was so captivated by it. I started making these box sculpture things. And I realized almost immediately, oh, I'm not a painter. I'm a sculptor. I mean, it was just like, you know, how do you put these clothes on and know that they fit so well, you know? How does that work? How does that happen? So uh, then I was lucky to get into the Kansas City Art Institute. And I, you know, I had early years with uh, there with other artists, again, all great people, super motivated, very big. I mean, that was wild times, those 70s, right? We kind of don't have that anymore. We were doing things in art school that were quite ambitious, quite advanced, and had lots of material associated with it, large scale pieces, endeavors. And, you know, today people don't have, you know, it's a very, it's a much more narrow experience. I can say that as a teacher, and I can also say that as going around to all these art schools, giving talks and lectures, um, you know, the, that sense of ambition is kind of, well, uh, you know, again, the 70s were this wild anarchic time. They were just mm -hmm. bursting at the seams with creativity while the rest of the culture was somehow, you know, stuck, right? But, you know, New York City didn't even hesitate. You know, the, the music scene was extraordinary. It just was exploding. So I loved all that stuff, you know, and I loved that early experience of being able to do large scale public works without any permissions. You know, we just did right. things. And today you could never pull a thing like that off. The control systems are extreme. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I definitely have this punk mm -hmm. background, you know, mm -hmm. and punk art school, you know, you remember that David Byrne was, was in an art school and, right. you know, they started the talking heads and all that sure. stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was like, uh, that, that was, I'm still carrying that, Inside of me somewhere is still this punk ethic, you know, mm -hmm. this punk aesthetic. Uh, gotcha. Huh. So that's Interesting. Kind of yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, definitely a lot, you know, that 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 rebellious spirit, I think, is a lot of times what makes people want to follow the the path, you know, yeah. of being an artist yeah. in the first place. But um, yeah. um, and then sort of going more towards 
the establishment side, like I saw in your Wikipedia page that you had shown in the Whitney, like, can you tell me a little bit about that, that work and yeah. how you ended up there? Well, that was, uh, you know, that was uh, 1995. And uh, I had done, I had done a sort of a show with uh, Lisa Spellman at 303. And that was this very um, kind of very art the povera kind of work and stuff. It was kind of very casual in a way. It, it, you know, it was definitely all about language and it was definitely all about, um, um, you know, also about the hand and about sort of the evolution of something over time, you know, s things changing and, and, and the whole show, I forget, I don't think I had a title. I think the show might have been called Untitled or something like that. But it had all kinds of pieces in it, like Doobie Doobie Doo and Caduceus and, uh, and um, uh, sorry, I forget, I'm forgetting the name of one of the pieces. But, uh, you know, some of the, one of those pieces is the, Whit the collection of the Whitney Museum, et cetera. But it was kind of about, it was an early attempt to kind of deal with the construction of male, of masculinity right the masculine thing and so uh the the sort of rubric or the question was something about doing and being right and the finger represented a kind of a doing and the you know the penis a kind of being so the pieces were all made of fingers and penises right mm -hmm. caduceus was these two huge you know i could uh, i could even get a couple of pictures of those up they were really odd you know i i couldn't actually believe well, let that me I, give you um let me um I think I need to give you some sort of uh, co-host privilege to share your screen in one sec. I probably should have done that ahead of time. Here no we go. problem. Um, all right, now it's right. um, here. Let's see now. I wasn't really thinking that I'd end up talking about this, but you know, I was very influenced by feminism, right? And very, you know, when we were in the university, there was an awful lot of classes we were taking and reading we were doing and stuff that was going on. And we, you know, I don't see your screen. I don't know if you need to. Oh, I haven't, uh, I haven't shared. Oh, you didn't share it yet. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, whatever you want to, whatever you want to show. Oh, there we go. Here's cool. one of them. Uh, this was a piece called Doobie Doobie Doo. And, you know, it, you can see how casual they were. They were steel studs. You know, I worked with the, and then these wires, and then there were, plasticine clay pieces out on the edge and stuff like that. Now I, I'm having a hard time finding this, uh, finding that works. Um, offhand, because I really wasn't prepared to talk about these pieces. Gotcha. But, Sorry, uh, I kind of like uh, no, it's pulled cool that out of the hat, you know, but I thought cool that, was be, a, that was a really an interesting. Yeah, it's kind of cool to be talking about that stuff actually, because you know, I think it has a lot of influence on today. Um, again, I was interested in the construction of masculinity, you know, and I wanted, I, I really felt, you know, I, I rationalized that I really couldn't address or speak to issues, you know, that, that, wow, I really am not finding this easily, but I, I couldn't really speak to f f issues for women. Right, it would be presumptuous sure. for me to do so. But what I could do is I could examine the masculine and examine how that played and behaved. And so I set up these sort of, you know, very influenced by Nauman for sure. And um, uh, gosh, I just, I'm distracted trying. I, I just sense that it's the next, you know, title that I'm going to read here. Um, let's see. Oh, one of, let's see. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, dumpsters and clowns. Okay, I'm not going to find it. We'll That's just okay. Let it... I mean, if you want to, do you want to pull up some some current work or um, you know, yeah, like definitely. But I'll just, I mean, it does. Seeing... It 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 is important, right? And you know, I'll just go to my website here. You know, it's probably something on my website, by the way. Gotcha. And that's just um, yeah. Like here it is. Dot org. Right here on my website. Wouldn't you think I'd okay. know that? There you go. Yeah, right here on my website. So, um, you know, this. Uh, again, maybe not great documentation. Back in the corner over here was Caduceus. This was called Stud Study. Uh, this was something about monkey, see, well, monkey see, monkey do. There was a monkey, two monkeys climbing up inside of the, the uh, lamp over here. There was the 
dooby dooby doo back there in the corner. And uh, those are the monkeys climbing up. And, you know, I kind of was inspired by and interested in, uh, you know, the art of the time, you know, I mean, Nauman was a big influence, as I mentioned, and the use of language and the use of these kind of uh, language structures to interrogate objects and to see their sort of devolution as they go. Terrible picture, but this little tag right there says, uh, gosh, you know, there it is. It says word. So that the gap between two places was filled with a word. You know, that was the, the kind of uh, thing that I was trying to get at. Um, you know, it was written about, which was fun. You know, it was my, my swans, you know, my first show in New York. And, and you know, it, it kind of had a drum roll to it and all that stuff. But then I went on and I started making a completely different kind of work, which, um, because, and those were the pieces that were in the Whitney Museum. And those were the finger, they were finger pieces. Too. Did yeah, you, here we go. Did the, you the, live like downtown in that um, kind of area, like down in the yeah, Lower I mean, East I, Side Village? Area? Uh, yeah, I lived in, I, I bounced in and out of New York, right? So I lived on, um, I lived on uh, 14th Street between B and C. And I lived there since like, my brother got that apartment in like, I don't know, maybe 1977 or something like that. And we sort of kept it in the family and for a while. He had it, I had it, we rented it out, we did this. Is that in Stuyvesant Town or is no, that it's a little the street. bit? It's across oh, okay, the street gotcha. from Stuyvesant Town. Yeah, it's on the south side of the street. And, um, you know, that was the Lower East Side. But then when, when I was doing these pieces, I had been teaching at Oberlin. But then I came back to New York and I lived on Walker Street, right? And so gotcha. that was kind of interesting. But I, I can't, I'm not finding on my website those early Pudo pieces, but then they inspired 2005 Pudo pieces. I went back and re-investigated re it. And these were the kind of the monster series, so to speak. And, um, oh, cool. and, you know, we could do these animations and stuff. And I was so interested in all of the kind of affordances that technology was bringing me. And the fact that any one of these frames could become a sculpture, so that not no, only- is this rendered or is this like claymation? No, this is rendered. These are wow. physical objects that are rendered. Uh, not physical objects. I'm sorry. They're virtual objects that are rendered, and gotcha. you know, they're it's basically keyframe animation. Um, and so, uh, you know, but what's incredible is that I'm able to use time as an element of sculpture. Right. Uh, and I'm like seeing an NFT while I'm watching this yeah, right now. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. that should be minted. <laughs> I, I agree. I'm totally with you, my friend. Totally with you. And I did these works for a long time. I did a lot of them. And they were probably, you know, like probably some of the most successful works that I'd ever done. You know, what, I had what, what time frame is this made? This is like 2002 to 2008 or maybe even 2010. Huh. Um, and you know, I was working on a lot of things. I mean, I, I think that's one of the other things that artists naturally do. Uh, you know, sometimes people are really lucky and they just hit on something and it's very popular and then they just keep doing that and that's their thing. And for me, I'm just always interested in something else. Like that show at 303 got a lot of success and it made a splash and I moved on and I started doing these other pieces that maybe weren't received as well. Uh, and so, but I'm constantly doing that and I, you know, even though it's maybe a little bit difficult to work it out, to work at all the details of living out, um, it still is just naturally the way it works for me, you know? When did you start working with like, you know, render, like 3D rendering and, and basically like what, when did technology or computer technology kind of come into your practice? Yeah. How, well, how did that happen? Yeah, here's another, <laughs> this is a double NFT. Um, I started working with technology in about 1993. So it was pretty early, right? And what I'd heard, I'd found out about, I mean, you know, by the way, I'm not counting goofing around with my friend's MacBook, you know, Mac, Macintosh computer and doing drawings and the paint programs and all that sort of stuff and just goofing around with that and trying to see where we could find it, what we could do with it and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it was, so, so I'm not counting all that sort of earlier stuff, but by but that definitely was like part of it, right? I mean, just even the, 
even the you know just the realization that like wow like i can i yeah. can use this in, in a creative way or you know i would just well, remember you know, those but the thing is it was so myself. expensive it was so expensive it's like a computer cost five thousand dollars and it's like yep. I, I was an artist i didn't have that kind of jack and i just thought i'll never be able to get this and but I also in the back of my head sort of said to myself, you know, I, I borrowed my friend's computer, went over and hung out with him and click, click, click and tried things. But then I also said to myself, you know, when this gets to deal with 3D, I'm in. And then mm -hmm. so 1993 is sort of a moment. A friend, a good friend of mine, Michael Gray, Michael Joaquin Gray was making these uh, beautiful sculptures, the Ganymedes, and he was doing it with stereolithography. And I think I also had seen a Matt Mulliken thing and i was like okay this is it i gotta get into this and i got an opportunity to teach at a school and the, they made it available to us to learn to to be upgraded right to learn about this stuff and so i did photoshop and illustrator and at that point i used a program called alias sketch for the 3d stuff but it couldn't quite make its way into physical objects yet is a wavefront right it was wave. It was like Wavefront Junior. It was like the sort of popular, you know, we'll make something for the masses. You know, cost a couple hundred bucks versus you know, Alias Wavefront, the big boy. That was at those days. That was like a thirty-five thousand or maybe even fifty thousand mm. dollar thing. It only ran on silver. Yeah, yeah. No, I, re I recognize the name. I like. I mean, yeah. I I dabbled with like the yeah. desktop level Mac three D stuff. Um, yeah. You know. And, you know, Greg Little was somebody that was really into this stuff really early. When I was teaching at Oberlin, which was 90 to 93, Greg Little was somebody who was doing these incredible renderings. I think he was using an, an early 3D Studio Max or precursor mm -hmm. to 3D Studio Max. Well, Joseph Nekvital was the guy that connected me to Greg. Ah. Um, when, and, and then, um, you know, and then I found out that Bowling Green had this relationship with Silicon Graphics and they had an Onyx workstation, which oh, you know, wow. at the time was like, you know, <laughs> amazing it was like they had the the monolith from um whatever that movie was you know but it was like the you know and then i remember getting there and there was like a little room where like the 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 computer art grads got as our our studio our studio which was like a closet you know and there's like the onyx in the corner like gathering dust you know and it was so sad that like i built it up into like and by that time you know desktop rendering was like uh, standard practice you didn't need practice. this um yeah. you know this 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 souped up you know kind of mini computer you know yeah. or mini mini mainframe or whatever you want to call it so but uh but yeah it, it's it's fun to reminisce about like the you know the the technology back then and yeah, but, i mean you know, you know just the idea that it could be in in the hands you know like that what's capable what's what's possible on a desktop now i mean it, it was something that um was only accessible to the studios back yep, then. That's know? exactly right. And then, but you know, to me again, the, the interest was to always, the physical component was always oh, wow. really important to me. And you know, Joseph wrote that interesting book, Immersion Into Noise, and he talks about his ideas about the actual, the virtual and the actual. And you know, I'm always sort of been committed to that. So this is obviously one frame of that an animation frozen in time and put on this, you know, put in this place, this particular spot. And it's that's still, a physical, is that a physical? Yeah, sculpture? that's a sculpture. That's, yeah, that's a physical wow. sculpture. That's incredible. Eight, 18 feet tall from the foot to the top of the fingers. So how and, do you go from like a, a 3D rendered, you know, digital object to something of that scale? Yeah, well, I mean, um, with great pain. <laughs> 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 that's how you do it. No, I mean, actually it's become easier than it's ever been. But in this case, the form was uh, milled on a three axis mill. And then we assembled all the individual parts because we couldn't mill it in one single shot. And we assembled all the, in, uh, the, the different parts. And the, we, actually inside of that thing is a big steel girder that holds it into place and keeps it, keeps it set. And um, it just, um, uh, once, once you have the 3D model, that 3D model is translatable either through 3D printing, through a kind of a printer driver kind of situation, or through uh, various tool paths in a CAD CAM, CAM standing for computer aided manufacturer kind of environment, right? Hmm. And at this point, this is the way the world is made, you know, uh, everything, you know, everything from soup to nuts 
is manufactured in this manner. Mm. When I first started, it was, it was, they were just getting off the ground. They were just beginning. But I, I think it was an interesting time. And one of the things that I always saw was an interesting parallel between things that were going on in this tech world that ostensibly had no interest in art and things that were going on in the art world. You know, I mentioned Nauman, for example. Nauman made those tunnel pieces. If you remember, they go from like cr different cross sections. He made all kinds of different versions of them, right? And they went from different cross sections, maybe a square to a triangle to a circle, et cetera, right? And those were essentially algorithmic pieces. And, uh, you know, basically they were essentially algorithms. So, and Nauman, I don't think it's well known or well talked about, was, had studied math and he was very conversant with all these mathematical things. So I saw this parallel all the time between an artist and what an artist is doing and computers and what a computer, computers are trying to figure out the very same algorithms with the silicon graphic machines we're talking about, except they were on mainframes and it cost a fortune to develop. And Nauman was doing the same thing in his studio. I mean, I think it came later with, with um, you know, I mean, I did a whole project uh, called the Sculptural User Interface and I had all these ideas, but Linux to me was another sort of thing that wasn't ostensibly directly involved with art or, it, or even, aware of the dialogue about art, but actually used artistic means. And that, that I'm in my interpretation of this is that they kind of made the, re they took the ready-made and they made it ready. Now that refers both to Duchamp, of course, but it also refers to Kosuth who wrote about that. And he actually coined this like sort of terminology, the, the ready-made made ready, but that's what open source did. It basically put toolkits out there on, online for anybody to use for any purpose. It took a off the you know ready-made code or off-the-shelf code, and it made it available to anybody to do their to do their purposes with. And so again, I see that as a kind of a reflection of two parts of culture that may not know anything about each other, still working on some of the same kinds of problems and some of the having the same kinds of implications. You know. Um, Again, if if I'd been a little more prepared, I'd bring up a book that uh, it's. Um, let me just see if I can find it real quick. And you know, but it's interesting that you you relate like um, Linux or Linux to to you know the ready made. I never really, you know, I mean they both are sort of a response to, you know, a philosophical issue maybe yeah. you know with with sort of scarcity or um, you know the. Um, I guess, you know, people um, prior to open source programming, you know, uh, I think having access to, to, to development tools and everything else like that, you know, it was very sort of rarefied, um, yeah. you know, like before there was Blender. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't own a 3D program without either being extremely wealthy or, yeah. or pirating it, essentially, yeah, and, you, know? And, you know. And basically, even the computer companies gave us all license to, uh, gave us all license to pirate it. I mean, Bill right. Gates- Or said, being part of an academic institution where you have yeah. access to it too. But, you know, Bill yeah. Gates said, I don't mind if they steal it just as long as they steal mine because he knew eventually <laughs> it was a long game and they would all end up mm -hmm. using Microsoft or, mm -hmm. you know, Maya or whatever. And that's sort of right. turned out to be. But, you know, the other thing that was happening a lot, what I loved about digital media was the ability to collect and sort of, work with ideas you know this was like just this little book that i made to kind of document some of my ideas that i used wow. to give to people and so you know this is the sort of visual essay of what i was thinking about when i was developing this is a these are you know this is the sculptural user interface right and the act of typing made three-dimensional form and i created this whole uh, you know i created this whole program that would make sculptures like what you see in the upper left hand corner uh, you know, that was the screen grab of those sculptures, right? And so basically, you know, a, word, a, a letter would be associated with a form, and then you would type in that, you know, you'd type a letter or you'd do anything you wanted to. It could be an absurdist poem. It could be a secret agent story. It could be whatever you wanted. And then I had these ideas about how I would like to work that into a full installation with computer stations and all this stuff. Some of it's very naive and very clumsy, 
you know, looking back on it. But at the same time, you know, it's research. And that's one of the other things that technology did for me is it freed me up from being only about expression, you know, uh, tech expressionism notwithstanding, but it allowed me to be, you know, to, to delve into ideas and to combine strange bedfellows. So, you know, this is a pretty strange bunch of bedfellows here. We have, you know, Duchamp, Boys, Kosuth, and Linux, you know, there, there it is. There's my sort of visual essay, you know? Hmm. And then at the same time, I was also interested in tree branching systems because mm. the sculptural user interface was essentially a tree branch. You know, it or, or always, if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that. Sure. And so this is, uh, you know, this is Darwin's famous, little Darwinian famous thing. This is the Sephiroth, the tree of life thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I just was kind of interested across cultures and time about, you know, once again, I can put the Duchamp bottle tree in there. These things were really fascinating to me, right? And, mm -hmm. and I was interested to, to look and to draw them all into the same space and to imagine them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's so, funny too, because I feel like, you know, the longer I've been involved in this sort of tech expressionism project with it sort of having been coalesced into a group, the more that, you know, I sort of question, you know, what constitutes um expression that is you know under underneath um the the intellectualization there's still a feeling about something that's sort of like the kernel you know what i mean and yeah. it's interesting to think that uh, of, of things that way that that on the surface seem very um you know conceptual and intellectual but then if you dig down into the sort of origin story of the idea there's this kernel that is about a feeling about something, you know, some issue, some something, you know, like it's, right. I, I feel well, like it's know, almost like, a, you know, yeah. with, with the anything to do with a human being, right? Like there's, there's, that's what separates us from, from machines, yeah. you know? Well, we have a synthetic imagination for sure. And we also, I mean, I think the thing that's kind of important is that, um, you know, the hybrid is, you know, being able to put this together with that, it's such a basic thing, it's, but it's a metaphor. Already it's a metaphor. And this is, this is really at the root of language, you know, the development of metaphor and our ability to say metaphor and do metaphor. And as, as you say, you know, you dig down to the basement of it and there's some, some something bugging you some kernel some you're almost like the princess in the pea you just you just can't get comfortable you got to go at it you got to feel it you got to bring it up you got to look at these things and imagine and sometimes you're totally wrong but the point is the speculation you know it's interesting to imagine the difference between expression and speculation right because for me uh that is that's a rich territory Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the idea of speculating. This is essentially what I'm doing here. There's no objective relationship between, you know, between these artists. Right. I'm making up the narrative mm -hmm. that weaves these things together for me. And maybe it's good for you, too. I don't know. But I'm looking at it. That's the point. And, you know, uh, it, I think it's interesting because this work, uh, the, you know, the sculptural user interface, at the same time, I'm also working with uh, it's too bad I can't call it up, but the program is so long gone. It worked on, it worked on the Macintosh operating system 10.6.8 was the last time that I could use it. And I just don't have the wherewithal, the means, the attention to keep this program going. And I, I installed a virtual, a virtual box or a, one of those parallels, I think, just because I, I used to love, I don't know if you ever used Adobe Streamline. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they killed that off, you know, years ago, yeah. but I really... I could make things with that program that I couldn't make in anything else, you right. know, I ended up getting installing, you know, this emulator just so I could run an old version of Mac OS yeah. on my, on my machine, just, you know, well, I'm going to have to consult with you about that. Cause I would like yeah. to get a copy of that. And cause I still have the program, of course. Yeah. If you so have again, parallels, you can, you can install, you know, off of, uh, uh, um, you know, if you have the installer CDs, you know, yeah. it'll work. For sure. Oh, I don't know if I have the installer CV, CVs in CDs. Or the disk images, too. As long as you have the disk images in a serial, you know, you're good to go. 
Yeah. But, you know, so this work, I was kind of concurrently working with this stuff. And these are the, you know, I showed you that animation and this is one of the sculptures that got, um, got realized from that animation. And, you know, again, I would really love to pull together these sort of like, I don't know, visual, I, I don't know what to call them. I, I, visual essays is too literal too. Who is but, that one in the red background? That looks really- You mean this orange one right here in the middle is Francis yeah. Bacon. Okay, yeah, yeah, Francis yeah, Bacon, sure. You know? Gotcha. And, and, you know, I'm just kind of, again, examining things that are of interest to me and, and you know, kind of creating works. Hans Belmer, of course, and Joseph Boys with the animal, biting the animal, the sheep with, uh, you know, and then the Nauman and then Abu Ghraib. I mean, you know, somehow these are poles, right? All the way from the Dance of Joy and Matisse to the Abu Ghraib pyramid, you know, that disgusting moment in American culture, right? In, in American politics. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, drawing together different parts of my work. This work on the left was from that period of 303 that I showed you with earlier. The, and I did these performance photographs and stuff. And the piece on the right being, you know, kind of also a kind of a dance or a performative space. There was always an animation and a physical sculpture and a performative space. And so I was dealing with those different ranges uh, and trying to, you know, I don't know, being an artist about it, just being in my studio, putting this next to that, next to that, and imagining, you know, possibilities, imagining places to be, imagining ways to work, you know? Um, so these are all examples of different versions of that stuff, you know? Uh, so anyway, it's kind of fun for me to look back on that. I don't often show this very much anymore. So, uh, you know, but that's definitely part of, you know, my, my, my growth and my development. Also, you know, in, in the 80s, in the 90s, I'm sorry, in the 90s, I got really interested in these pieces. I mean, we're just going on down memory lane here. <laughs> uh -huh. This was the Ajna series. And, you know, it was very inspired. I mean, I mean, look at these. Uh, mm, beautiful. Look, I don't know, you know, I, I'm always a little hesitant to say it, but look, for me, this image is extraordinary. I love this image, it's beautiful. And what's incredible about it is it reminds me a little bit of something that's always been kind of near and dear to my heart, which is, I don't know if you remember the Kafka, the penal colony, right? And in the penal colony, the engineer who take, is gonna fix the machine because it's misbehaving and all this stuff. And he pulls out a drawing and the drawing is described in the text and it's an incredible, text right beautiful beautifully written and but the lines are so dense that you can't understand anything unless you have extreme expertise and so this kind of reminds me of that penal colony moment and all of the things that implies but but at the same time you can make things out you can make shadows of things out and you can kind of and again these are works of imagination this is a, a kind of an imaginary anatomy um but but I, it coincides, I mean, these, all these works, I wanna say, all these works have rich layers that are associated with it. And I sometimes am not very good at getting to all the layers, but you know, this, is, this work is being developed at the same time that the Visible Human Project is being developed. And that right, was- Right, I remember that. That was one of the first digital portraits of the internal anatomy. And I was very excited about all that stuff. I thought it was extraordinary. You know, they got a criminal, they, they sliced him and diced him. He donated his body to science. And supposedly they made one of the most accurate portraits of human anatomy that had ever been made up until that point. And there were these amazing pictures of that. And some of them were pictures where it had the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci behind the actual uh, three-dimensional anatomy. One in particular was the way the eyeballs were. They had the drawings in the background, you know, computer renderings, right? Which, uh -huh. you know, very technical. The Leonardo drawings as wallpaper in the background where the 3D model of the guy's eyeball socket was floating in the center. I mean, they were incredible. I had the CD-ROM, I think, where yeah. you could go through the slices yeah. and, you know, I remember yeah, that CD-ROM. It was amazing. That's like I another relic. <laughs> but I loved thinking also about, you know, Leonardo as brilliant as he was in the invention of the, uh, you know, the invention of sort of empirical observation. I mean, I loved all those stories. I loved, 
you know, Titian doing those, uh, you know, those drawings, I'm forgetting the names of them right now, you know, the, the character, the body exposed holding the skin. And Titian did the drawings of these, the first anatomy book by Vesalius, right? Vesalius was the first anatomy book. I think I got that right. Um, and, you know, they were, I loved all the stories. I loved imagining a time when bodies, which usually were put to the grave, were now all of a sudden in scientific laboratories and people were risking their lives to study how we are, what we are. And, and, and just what a tremendous moment that was. And then at the same time to see this Leonardo drawing, Leonardo, the, you know, kind of doing empirical observation, you know, really like an important moment in the modern experience, what became the modern experience. And um, knowing that he got things wrong because he drew them according to the beliefs of the day. Right, he drew the male and the female reproductive system, for example, according to what they thought how it, they thought it worked, and he was wrong. It wasn't correct. He didn't have enough knowledge. It isn't, and so I thought that was amazing to have a masterpiece by an artist, an artist sort of enacting this empirical aspect, but also to have in the foreground what is put forward to be the perfect representation of the human anatomy. And when it is actually saying that we could easily, just as easily be wrong about the functions of things in our body. We don't understand certain things. We still don't understand certain things, although we're able to manipulate them and use them. Sure. And, so, and so I started to blend a sort of an Eastern or what I imagine to be an Eastern metaphysical anatomy with a Western sort of analytic anatomy, right? And again, in a speculative, Fan, fanciful, fantastical kind of way. Those early wireframes that you saw gave way to these pieces, um, meaning that they were 3D printed from, mm. from the digital files, right? Mm. And so there is the, there they are. And it, this is Ajna 1, Ajna 2, Ajna 3. Ajna is the uh, Hindi word for chakra, uh, for the, the sixth chakra, the one in your forehead there. I've got some things going on with that. And these are kind of occult images on some level, but again, they're also fantasies. They're ways to think about the body and to play with the body and, and to realize it. And I, you know, when you're making work like this, it's kind of incredible. When you're all in, you're all in, you know? Uh -huh. And I was all into this work. I lived alone pretty much in a loft. And I, I, I moved back to Kansas City, Missouri because I could pay $400 a month to live in this loft. And I, spent every dime I had on computers. I remember I had the worst diet ever. I, you know, about three in the afternoon, I used to go get Reese's peanut butter cups and cigarettes and come back and eat them. And that was my, that was <laughs> like, that was my lunchtime Familiar. meal. And, and I was just all in with these. And I was mm -hmm. making this stuff. And, you know, th this was at the Whitney Biennial, the 1995 Biennial. And these were the Ajna Spine series, you know. Wow. And of course, this, the, the tables are kind of a, maybe a little bit of a Wunderkammer kind of look, a cabinet of curiosities kind of thing. And, um, and then those wireframe drawings in the background and stuff. And, uh, you know, I was really lucky because each one of these things were really expensive to make, but I had two things happen to me that were really lucky. First of all, I started writing articles about rapid prototyping in rapid prototyping journals. These were mechanical engineering journals, mm -hmm. completely absurd thing to do, but, I was just fascinated by the fact, you know, Duchamp once said that, uh, you know, he was an aesthetic engineer. That's what he called himself. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how interesting to sort of blend together this notion of it, which is sort of maybe what technology is, to blend together engineering and art and put them into the same conversation, the same dialogue. And um, mm -hmm. sorry, I sort of forgot where I was headed with that. Um, well, I think like, you know, in today's world, that's, assumed to be a dichotomy, but maybe back in the day, they were basically synonymous. Yeah, they, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think in the Renaissance, they were synonymous. I really do. I think they're, you know, and Leonardo is the perfect exemplar of that. And I think somehow or another, uh, partially because of the mystical part, I mean, you know, there was a lot of people exploring, uh, you know, the natural world and wondering whether it was really metaphysically developed. And then there were also people exploring the natural world, believing that it was metaphysically developed. And that's, a, you know, Newton 
is it's you know he wrote metaphysics he wrote uh, several volumes in metaphysics and so those things but then they got cleaved apart you know and they got cleaved maybe for good purpose maybe for good reason but um you know the uh the thing that was kind of uh th this was just a really important thing for me to investigate you know it's, a, it's an incredible work yeah. um so it so tell me a little bit about the work that's behind you in the sort of virtual background those inflatables sure. i know you presented on them a little bit at the salon um but for the people yeah. who haven't seen that if you could just tell us a little bit about that yeah, let, body me, of work. let me get some stuff up here yeah this is um you know this is my most most recent body of work and um it it is wait somehow i'm all goofed up here give me a second here I want to get back to where it was. There we go, synthetic cells. And then we're here. There we go. Sorry. Sorry about that. Now, so this was, um, you know, I had a, was very fortunate to be invited by the curator, Tom Moran, to do a show at Grounds for Sculpture. And part of this is that I had done a, a previous show called Clown Town, which was deeply, I've been working with augmented reality since about 2012, maybe. And, um, really kind of exploring and experimenting and learning and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, the, of course, there's Manifest AR who were way early. I think they were in 2010. You know, people like Mark Squarek and, and Will Pappenheimer and Chris Manzione and, and all kinds of other, Tomiko Thiel, all kinds of wonderful, all the wonderful other people exploring and experimenting. So I'm getting to it kind of a little bit later, but totally intrigued by it, instantly amazed by what AR is and what it can do. And, you know, you got to be careful, of course, you got to check yourself at the door, it can't all be technology. But it seemed to me that what augmented reality offered us was a kind of an instant semiotic, a way to control what we're seeing by adding other information to it, to augment the information, basically. And it was definitely couched in language as opposed to nature, right? It wasn't a phenomenon of nature, so to speak. It was more a phenomenon of culture. And so the, re the way that I put this is that, you know, when that famous film was shown where the train is driving into, when photography film was invented and the train is driving into the audience, the audience is diving out of the way, thinking that the train is coming right at them. When indeed, Augmented reality is exactly the opposite of that. We are completely aware that it is uh, not natural. It is constructed and synthetic. And so we have a completely different response to it than we do to believing that it's real, right? In other words, I would never, uh, never mistake something I see in the augment for being real. I know that it is a synthetic construction, some kind of you know, could be poetic, could be informational, what have you. And so that was fascinating to me from the get go. Mm. I studied that from the beginning and tried to make sense of how to use, you know, augmented reality. And I kind of created a platform for myself of the virtual to through photographic to the interactive. And the interactive part is the augmented reality. So I had these physical objects and, um, you know, they would often have photographs or photographic targets on them. And those photographic targets would, uh, you know, in this case, the photographic target is the, the, the picture of the wall. And what it brought up was this animated pig, right? So the pig could walk in space and you could interact with the pig. You can make it larger and smaller. It was, and there, there was a second pig in the back that was just circling around. You could interact with the front pig, but the back pig just circled around. It was always present. And, you know, a little bit I was trying to, I, I saw these as pastoral sculptures, sculptures about the landscape or about nature and about animals or, you know, the human pastoral experience. And, um, but I also in my mind, of course, was the idea that, you know, math is the universal language of nature and how if you don't know any math or math is, foreign to you or difficult to understand how strange an idea that seems to you and so uh, how strange it could be that mathematics something so abstract actually controls the growth of 
you know, cells on the skin and all this, you know, it's, it's like a very specific point of view. And so I kind of wanted to play with that. I wanted to work with mm. it. And mm -hmm. so on the one hand, you have these objects, which are, you know, computer generated designs uh, that are, you know, like I would describe them in a way as mathematical objects, primarily because they couldn't exist without the computer math that created them. And at the same time, some of these, uh, some of these formulas are very similar to the formulas of the Schwartz field metric, which describes, you know, the black holes and things like that, you know. Now, again, that makes me sound like I'm really smart. And I know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just <laughs> synthetically organizing these things in, way, in ways that are interested, interesting mm. to me, you know. And so when I call them a math object, that's kind of what I'm getting at. You know that that it took math to make them. It wasn't an it wasn't an action of my hands molding something. I didn't find something in space. It took this computer program to create these forms and shapes, and yet they have this notion of a portal about them, etc. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, the image becomes a portal of sorts, a different kind of portal, and what it calls up. Only, but these things, when you first see them, you don't have the tablets in your hand. You see them as images and you see them like you would see a photograph. So these photographs, I had many people say, why are you putting those images on those beautiful sculptures? You know, what is the point? Blah, blah, blah. They didn't realize immediately that it was the augmented reality. And so then what happens is the photograph kind of destabilizes the sculpture. And then the augmented reality destabilizes both of those, both the photograph and the sculpture. And then you're left once again with sort of a challenge of sorts, or you're, it's put to you to fabricate what is actually happening, what is actually going on. Now, I think in the future, when people are completely comfortable with AR, that won't be as much of an issue, right? It, it'll, people will begin to have different kinds of experiences around augmented reality. But now in its early days, people are people are surprised when it happens and uh -huh. the the tablet you take the tablet around with you and you have to focus the tablet on the picture and so there's an aspect of you as the viewer finding the experience and there's a sense of discovery in that this can't be conveyed with this picture you know it, it just can't and this is a, such an important aspect of the experience of these works um all the, the, the sculpture was called synthetic cells, sight and parasite. And the, the parasite aspect was both to deal with these insects and animals that are commensal with human beings, meaning that there are no environments that don't have these, these, these animals or insects. And also, um, so, so, and then that was, uh, you know, so the augmented reality has kind of a parasitic relationship to the sculpture, right? It's inside of that sculpture, it's invested in it. it it's hidden in there almost. And we have to use this viewing device to allow it to be revealed. And then, but at the same time, I also had a second aspect of the exhibition, which was always planned. And that was that other artists could um, participate in the show. And we invited many other artists that did augmented reality to join us, and I mentioned some of them, there were Chris Manzione, Will Pappenheimer, John Craig Freeman, Claudia Hart, Tomiko Thiel, uh, I think I got everybody, there's six. Oh, Carla Gannis and Carla Gannis. And each of them developed pieces, uh, you know, specifically for the exhibition. This was a, sorry, that was a turtle clock. And so the turtle went around in 360 degrees and every three seconds stuck its head out. Right, hmm. and did that. Um, so you know, uh, so it was a, it was a big kind of. There was a rooster uh, against that piece, a, a house fly, a common house fly. Now I think I can find some. Uh, I think I can find some animations of this, and animations are always good because um, it really does kind of give a sense or help you understand what is actually happening. So are the tablets um, sort of like installed as part of the exhibition in fixed places or no. how does it work with the no. experience of it? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question because uh, I, I developed, I was one of the first people to do this. Everybody I know that's an augmented reality artist is like, oh my God, I'm going to steal that. And they have. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I have a, a stand on wheels 
and then I have a uh, mount, and then the the tablet goes onto the mount. And so you literally, you know, when you ask for it, whatever, you grab the tablet, and you're able to walk around, and um, you're able to walk around and train it on each of the images to get the experience of what you're trying to. Now let's see if I. Oh. Well, I thought I almost had it there. Is it amazing how many photographs we take these days? Yeah, it looks like you have a pretty good storehouse yeah. there. I do, and I like if I were a little bit better prepared, I'd have this. I've had this at the ready for you. Oh darn it! And I, oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. Okay, so this might be able to give you a bit of a sense of having a whole experience of the piece. No, that's not the one, that's not a good one. Sorry about that. Let's try this one. You kind of bring the tablet to it and then I the see. augment shows up and then you're able with finger gestures to interact with the, with the, the pig inside there. Mm. And that was actually quite a fun thing because uh, kids especially, but people in general, would do a lot of play with this. So they'd pose the pig in a certain place and they'd get their friend to stand in between the, the screen and the sculpture. And then they would take pictures of it, right? And then they would laugh hysterically and have a great time. They would, you know, the pig, they'd put the pig kissing the person or something like that. Right, And sure. that was very much, I mean, I really, this show I wanted to have, you know, the overwhelming, the overarching experience of the show, I wanted it to be joy. I wanted to bring joy to the table. I, I, I put this show, it sort of has a cousin or maybe a brother or a sister in the Clown Town show, which was a very political show, which also had augmented reality in it in a very deep way. And um, I put those two sort of together um, in, in part because the Clown Town show had this kind of analytic, heavy quality about this moment that we were in right at the change from, you know, the Obama presidency to the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. And this work, I sort of decided that I wanted to explore and experiment with trying to connect with people, not through an analytic or, or even maybe perhaps a, you know, sense of superior view or something like that, but actually just meet everyone in the same place meet mm. through joy let's find commonality and common relationships that we can build on let's mm. stop with the division and and all that sort of stuff so i really tried to do that with this show um you know and i had to, i i've always been a little bit lucky to have these wonderful experiences i was down during the show and i was hanging out in the show just sort of you know, taking care of business or something. And I, I saw these people and they were walking around with the tablet and they went from piece to piece to piece. And I noticed that they had missed something, that they didn't use the tablet correctly or something like that. And it was a mother and her two children, at least I presume. And I went over and I said, you know, excuse me, but I just want to let you know that there are these other experiences. All three of them, without exception, turned to me with this look on their face like, excuse me, but we're having an experience here. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. They didn't, they, everything they were experiencing was enough for them. And it was big uh -huh. and expansive and bold. Uh -huh. and, you know, and I, and I kind of loved that I had the, the great opportunity to experience that, to reach people on that level, you know? Uh -huh. That's awesome. That's like, you know, they, um, they weren't an external observer anymore they were that's a right. participant you know yeah, and that, totally that's something good. that's pretty rare i think you know in terms of um an artistic you know experience as as a consumer quote unquote of art you know to really feel that um you know yeah i agree with you, you. Know. i totally agree with you so, so yeah that's a great you know that's a really amazing body of work and um thank you very you much you know uh, I, I definitely, you know, I was struck by it when I saw you show it in the in the salon, and I think it it actually, um, you know, I, I was telling you before the interview, it, it, it I, you might have seen me. I posted about it that afterwards I went and searched for AR apps in in the app store, and and, and when I was hanging out with my six year old, you know, I got her to do 
to an AR piece by drawing a picture of our cat. And then the, the, that was the trigger image, you know, and then the video was a, a video of that cat, you know, and then yeah. dropped it on the, on the ottoman or whatever. And then, you know, Oh, and then you see the picture and then it just turns into the video. And it's really like, you know, it's like magic, you know, and, it, but it's, it's like the type of magic where, you're going to the magic show to see the magic, yeah. like, like how yeah. you were describing it. It isn't like, you know, you're shocked by this surprising experience. It's like, wow, here's like this really cool, like magical thing. And then you're primed to experience it by, you know, either being involved in the creative process or as a user of AR, you know, knowing that, that there's going to be this additional layer of information or experiential information on top of things and i think you know it definitely as time goes on this is going to be more and more just built into our personal daily lives you know i mean i think google glass was a little bit ahead of its time but you know i could see down the road there being you know this being something where um it does become just part of our normal everyday existence and it'll be interesting to see how that you know how that happens. I mean, it's the so, first it, time. Isn't it interesting how cre- how creepy Google Glass ended up coming off? And it yet, is strange. Well, yeah, I think part of it having... is like that Google has this storehouse of personal information on like every human being. So yeah. it's sort of like that combo creates some frightening possibilities right. <laughs> in a lot of ways. It really does. You know? It really does. Yeah. So here's some of the people, and you know. This is John Craig Freeman, and if you go to my website, you can read, you know, you can read their, their what they were thinking about their works, and you know, this was different than having a group show, because again, it had a, it was a show within a show, and each of the, and it, it sort of was a show about opportunities or possibilities, as opposed to sort of a, 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 a um, like an encapsulation of of one thing or another right? It was about, it was something that was expansive and reached out as opposed to focused and about a single thing. Uh, It was about AR, you know, on some level, but it was, uh, you know, it was about AR and so that it had that focus, but the works of the artist ranged widely and broadly, right? I mean, uh, this is Will Pappenheimer, Tomiko Thiel, Gardens of the Anthropocene and and Carla Gannis did a comedy routine with the inflatable boy that was very funny. Chris Munzion did, did sort of a, a, you know, kind of a, a, a more formal, but, but uh, almost experiential experience of objects and sound and different kinds of things. So there were just all kinds of attitudes and uh, expressed in the show. And I was really pleased. They were, people were really kind to be part of it, you know, to make, to make their way. Um, but yeah, that was that show. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I guess just, you know, to wrap up, um, and I've been kind of adding this on as like a, an additional question for the last couple of people, uh, artists that I've interviewed is, um, you know, um, from, from your standpoint, you know, um, you know, since we're sort of framing the, the interview within sort of this, um, text expressionism social sculpture or whatever you'd like to call it, you know, I'd like to, to, to sort of know what is it that, um, you know, interests you about the idea and, um, you know, what would your own sort of personal definition of it be? Oh, of, of text expressionism. Text expressionism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, I think that, I mean, I, I might have a long answer and a short answer. I think to kind of get at it a little bit, you know, human beings are tool makers. We're technologists. Uh, you know, that's not all we do. That's not the only thing that we're about. And so what's fascinating to me is that we've invented a sort of all-in-one technology, something that we're really literally trying to fit everything into. It's our mm-hmm. commerce, it's our health, it's, it's you know, and that's this, the, these computing devices, I, whether it's a computer or a phone, I don't really think it, those are form factor questions, not right. otherwise. And so the, the aspect that, I mean, it, the art world just never ceases to amaze me, how they maintain their gait and keep people out and so on and so forth. And how the word technology has this pejorative connotation. And part of that was the 1968 software show at uh, 
you know, at, at the Jewish Museum, which, you know, uh, and so, you know, and, and it flubbed up, but that is like the access point of the beginning of so much of art and art as we understand it today. And so the idea that technology is a font of experience. Now, this goes back to, is technology just a tool or is technology something else? So if we treat technology as a tool, then I just have these great tools that I'm working with and I can use them for whatever purposes. I'm, and they have no other greater import. But we all know that not to be the case. You just mentioned the way Google uses technology is actually kind of onerous and difficult and, and that it has all kinds of political implications as well as ethical, philosophical, other kinds of implications. And so and when their, I, their don't be evil motto, I yeah. think they started with that in yeah. premonition of <laughs> the capacity of how evil they were going to become. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. How evil they were going to become. Um, but, you know, so the, the thing that I'm kind of trying to get at here a little bit is that technology is a philosophy. It's a philosophy of behavior. Um, you know, it's a philosophy of many different things. And so this notion that the gatekeepers would keep technology away because for some reason, and they do, they try, they have, there haven't been as many, it's, it's starting to happen more and more as new generations, that's, they live in technology. So there's no question. Um, so the point is, is that technology is big. It's a big thing. It's a philosophy. It's full of attitudes and thoughts and positions and implications that we haven't quite completely thought out. And so to use it in an expressionistic manner, in other words, an intuitive, felt kind of way is inevitable. It's just inevitable. And so what I would think of about tech expressionism is I'd put it in the context of that inevitability. And also uh, that kind of intuitive, you know, I mean, I know some of my software, my, my favorite software so well, that they ostensibly disappear for me when I'm using them. Uh -huh. They, I'm aware that I'm on a computer in a, in a, in a 3D program. I'm aware, but all of a sudden it's so available to me. It's so immediate and it's so all encompassing to me that all of that can, I, I can suspend that for some period mm -hmm. of time. And so I think what we'll see, we won't see necessarily, you know, there's a big debate. Is there anything new here? Well, I don't know if there's anything new except that the speed and accessibility is greatly increased. And so that is going to mean that we might see different variants emerge. There might be some emergent behavior in this, in this aspect, in, this, in, this, in what happens with this technology. And I'm just, I'm along for the ride. I can't wait mm -hmm. to see it. I'm totally game for it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I would couch that, that big, that question a little bit. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I keep thinking back to that book by Negroponte being digital, you know, and this sort of like moment where it's bits versus atoms, you know, and like what constitutes reality, you know, and, and I feel like um, as time goes on, it's, it's like a meaningless question, you know, like it's, it's all reality. Um, and people used to think that, you know, what happens online is sort of separate from real life, quote unquote, you know, and as time moves forward, it just becomes more and more obvious that it's just a component of real life, you know, virtualization um, of everything. That's what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. You know, totally, so, totally. Yeah. Or, or sort of like actualization of what we thought was virtual, you know, yeah. Right. Um, That's right. Oh. Well, there you go. There's our Joseph Nekvital coinage, right. Portmanteau, the actual. Portman Actuality, actual. In, yeah. in a nutshell, sure yeah. thing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, you know, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, for for the interview, for your time, and yeah. you know, sharing your work with us. It was really interesting to see some of that earlier work too. I mean, yeah. um, those those wireframe forms and the the sculptures are just you yeah. know mind-boggling i really enjoy that stuff well so. colin i appreciate you inviting me to do this and i think that what you're doing is really interesting and I'm, I'm delighted that you're out here doing it so you know keep going man all right thank you michael all right have all a right, great well, day take, take care bye-bye